Hello, everyone. Welcome to another BDPA Tech and Career Talk. Uh, I am your host, Devin Jenkins. Um, <laughs> I've been recording my own podcast, what I was doing for a second. <laughs> but I, I am your host, Devin Jenkins, uh, US and Canada at GE Healthcare, and I'm my national tech and career talk leader or for BDPA. Have you those familiar? Uh, BDPA is Black Data Processing Associates uh, around 75. Um, work. Uh, to continue to build a diverse talent pipeline, especially in African American in the IT and technology field. So we focus professionals, um, building up um, the career development, providing opportunities for networking and continuing careers. Um, but we also have a focus on youth, especially middle and high school students. Uh, coding, competition, I'm um, another initiative of computer and technology youth. Um, I'm not sure and career, careers from the classroom to the boardroom. Uh, so thank you for being with us today. Our Tech and Career Talks take place on the second and fourth Friday of each month uh, from 11.30 to 12.30 Eastern. Uh, one hour, we have different speakers come in speaking on different topics. Some are more technical, some are more career related. Some have a nice balance of the two, uh, but we like to bring you something that everybody can relate to uh, that hits everybody at different stages their career. So uh, we're glad to have you. Uh, I must encourage you to go out to BD, conference.bdpa.org. Uh, make sure you register for BDPA Con 23 if you haven't already. Uh, the committee is planning an amazing experience for you in Atlanta, uh, August 17th through the 19th at the Weston Peachtree Plaza in Atlanta, Georgia. So make sure you go register, uh, tap in there. A great time. A free Training just got put in the chat. Um, and there's also a scholarship from Google out there that you can apply for to actually get conference registrations covered. Um, there's a number of tech conferences in there. So if you're in the BDPA mailing list, look at the latest conference newsletter. That information is in there, along with some other happenings at the conference this year. Well, that being said, we're going to get into um, I know our, our main entree for today. Uh, we look forward to this talk every year with our friends at the Air Force Research Laboratory. Um, in the past, I think the last three years, I want to say, uh, we've had Anissa Lumpkin, uh, who leads up the Air Force Research Laboratory. And I'm, I don't want to try her title right now because I know it's long. And I don't want to mess it up. I know the military takes that seriously. <laughs> but um, we appreciate her leadership as always. I mean, while she's not with us this year, we are glad to have Dr. Marcus Smith with us. Uh, who is the diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility officer uh, for the Air Force Research Laboratory. So Marcus, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing fantastic. How about yourself? Oh, uh, glad to have you with us today. Uh, so I, I think this may be a career talk first. Uh, so just, just to know, make everybody be family here, uh, why don't we start with just a quick intro of who you are and a little bit of your background. Yeah, for sure. And just before I start, it, your your audio got a little choppy on me. Can everybody hear Devin fine, or is it choppy for everybody else? It's messed up. Okay. All right, it was choppy. I, I, okay, let me uh, uh, let me try something here. Yep. It seems better now. I don't know if you changed anything. I didn't. <laughs> uh, we're gonna see so if you know i kind of started stumbling over my words a little bit because i got a notification that said my internet connection was unstable i said oh okay. lord <laughs> not right there now you go. There but you hopefully go. hopefully we're okay yep um yeah a little promising either but we're gonna keep moving if we okay. have problems let me know how to come back in or something so we'll okay. work with you. no problem okay no. all right Less talking to let you do more talking. Maybe we'll sound better. So. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. Sound check. Just wanted to make sure everybody can hear me, hear me loud and clear. All right, cool, cool. Well, first, of, first of all, I want to uh, say thank you all for having me. Excited to be here on behalf of Air Force Research Laboratory. Um, I know you're used to having my colleague Anissa Lumpkin, but hopefully, I can fit the bill just as well as she has over the last few years. Um, my name is Marcus Smith. I am the uh, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Officer for Air Force Research Laboratory. I'm coming to you from Dayton, Ohio, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and this is actually where I was born and raised. I've been spending a lot of time, a lot of my career, a lot of my life here in Dayton, Ohio, um, but I'm not sure how much longer that is going to last. 
Um, I, I started my career with AFRL, Air Force Research Laboratory, a little over 12 years ago uh, as an engineer. Um, I did my engineering degrees uh, undergrad and master's here locally at University of Dayton before transitioning into my, my career with Air Force Research Laboratory. Um, and over the last few years, um, I transitioned into this diversity and inclusion role. I'll, I'll get a little bit more, more into that as we evolve into the questions. Um, but outside of work, you know, I, I like to uh, consider myself a community advocate. Um, one of my uh, huge passions, um, huge passion projects is um, I'm a part of the leadership team of what's called the West Side Makerspace. Uh, the West Side Makerspace is a community owned and operated uh, makerspace where you can, people in the community can come uh, learn hands-on skills and, and trades anywhere from artisanal skills. So think of sewing machines, t-shirt press, mug press, all the way up to uh, tech and manufacturing. So think 3D printing, laser etching, things of that nature. So you can learn hands-on skills and trades, you can create and you can collaborate. And it is specifically embedded in the West Side, uh, West Side Dayton community for a reason. Many of the founders of this project are from the West Side of Dayton, including myself. Um, and we just really wanted the opportunity to pour back into uh, a part of Dayton that has just been really decimated over the years and experienced a number of inequities. So we are in the process of um, uh, getting to our permanent location um, and really excited to be able to offer this to the west side of Dayton. Um, additionally, in my free time, I'm an avid traveler, love traveling the world. Um, over the past month, um, I was able to go to Jamaica and Belize. Um, so, so looking forward to continuing to add st stamps to my passport. So just a little brief intro about myself. Um, I'll, I'll um, unravel more as we go along. Thank you. Um, and have that that foundation there. So, so speaking of foundation, you no, know, from what I understand about your career, and can you see it? Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right, great. So, so what I understand about your career is no, you're about here. Started as an engineer. I think you're a mechanic. Materials, 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 materials. Wrong N word. All right. Yeah. And can you notification again? Yeah, it's getting choppy. All right. Okay. Still choppy? Yes. Is it any better now with the video off? It actually is, yeah. All right, let's try this then. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so, so materials engineer, um, no, by trade, kind of started in engineering with that background and transitioned, you know, in, into a, a military leader uh, yeah. over time. So, how how was the transition uh, from engineering into military leadership, and how would you say that technical foundation kind of prepares you for leadership? Yeah, yeah. So let me walk you through a little bit of the the transition and how I got here. So as I mentioned um, in my last answer, I started my career with the Air Force Research Laboratory (AFRL) um, a little bit over twelve years ago. And it, I mean, you can add a few more years if you consider my time um, working for AFRL as a contractor. But when I started here, I was a, a bench scale research engineer. I was working at what's called the Fuels and Energy Branch, and we were um, I was studying jet fuel and really studying next generation additives for jet fuel. Um, I did that for a few years before I decided in 2014 that it was time for me to go back to school and pursue my PhD. Um, in order to pursue my PhD, I, I applied for the DOD SMART Fellowship. Um, and it, this fellowship is a, it's a scholarship for service. So um, if accepted into the scholarship opportunity, the Department of Defense pays for you to go to school for a number of years and in return you owe them X number of years to, to work for the Department of Defense. So I applied for that in 2014 and was awarded that uh, scholarship opportunity, decided to go to Georgia Institute of Technology down in Atlanta, Georgia to pursue my PhD. 
Um, I did so in materials engineering, um, finishing in 2019. But um, while I was there, um, I was studying next generation optical materials. So really looking at next generation lasers and detectors um, for various Department of Defense applications. But while I was there, um, you know, I was in classrooms where I was one of one or just one of few minority students. And it was incredibly frustrating. Uh, one of the offices that I had access to while I was at Georgia Tech under the College of Engineering was the Center for Engineering Education and Diversity, the seed office down at Georgia Tech. And in my free time, um, I, I found myself spending a lot of time with them and getting a lot of um, mentorship from that organization. And that transitioned into just me doing a number of recruitment and retention opportunity initiatives for uh, Georgia Tech specifically focused on their grad student population. Um, so once I finished my degree, 2019, it's time for me to come back to AFRL to start my service commitment. I owed them five years in, in exchange for the five years that they had paid for my PhD. Um, I got back to AFRL and it was like, Sure, I learned all these things doing my PhD, all these the, the research I was doing, but I was more excited about the initiatives that I was able to take part of um, while at Georgia Tech, specifically looking at the recruitment and retention piece. Um, so I, I was bringing those initiatives back to AFRL saying, hey, you know, there's a number of things that we could be doing in the diversity and inclusion space that would really propel us and, and set us up for the future. Um, and in light of, you know, summer 2020, the social unrest, um, we, we became very reflective and retrospective, trying to decide the way forward. I think many of organizations did that, right? And um, this was the, the prime opportunity. I started presenting, again, a number of these initiatives and opportunities that we could take advantage of. Um, and my director at the time asked me to, to help stand up our first diversity and inclusion office um, within that division. Uh, I did that for a number of years. Um, I was able to fast forward. I was able to work um, at the Air Force level, Air, for Air Force headquarters uh, for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion there. Um, I went out and got additional credentialing in the diversity and inclusion space, um, finishing my Cornell Certified Diversity Professional um, credentialing. Uh, and then last year, um, just a little over a year ago, yeah, April 22, I applied and was selected for the ch chief diversity officer for here at AFRL. And in terms of having the technical background, the last question you asked was, you know, how did that technical background prepare you for this leadership role? And I always tell people, you know, having a PhD, while it's in a very niche area um, and, and typically very unique to that person pursuing the PhD, at the end of the day, when you think of it on a much larger scheme, getting a PhD teaches you how to solve very complex problems. And those problems are not unique to um, uh, what you what you studied for your PhD. So I, I always credit my PhD, even though I'm no longer working in that field and that it allowed me, uh, it, it allowed me the ability to get an, a, a very analytical skill set that uh, helped me uh, to pursue and, and solve some of the challenging problems that 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 arise in my position today. Thanks, thanks for that background, and because uh, it's, it's it's good to be able to connect those dots and understand. You know, everything is connected. So, you know, getting the PhD and the way that kind of help shape your thinking process and ability to, to break down problems and apply, apply critical thinking and you know, intense situations uh, translates directly into effective leadership. So thank you for that. Thank you for walking us through that. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so what I would like to do, I wanna kind of transition into kind of the Air Force piece of this conversation. And um, I know we've, we've mentioned the Air Force Research Laboratory a few times, but everyone may not be familiar with what that is. So can you give us a little bit of background and uh, context around what the Air Force Research Laboratory is? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I say this often, um, the Air Force Research Laboratory, we really have very poor brand awareness. So we we are really revamping the way we we kind of brand and market who we are um, and just taking a different approach. A lot of people don't even realize um, you can be a civilian like myself in plain clothes working for Air Force Research Laboratory. But in terms of who we are, we are the science and technology arm supporting both the air 
and space forces. So unlike your large industry companies, such as your Googles, such as your Apples, we are not profit driven. We are here to solve complex, challenging problems in defense of our country. Um, and these problems can run the full gamut in terms of cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, hypersonic flight, human performance, rocket propulsion, space vehicles. Um, and I mean, there's many more behind that. Uh, we are an organization of roughly 11,000 people. Um, and the breakdown is about 1,000 military, uh, 5,000 civilians, and 5,000 military. 60% um, of our workforce uh, are scientists and engineers. Um, and then the other 40% of the house is what we like to call our, our functional and support. So think of business professionals, IT uh, specialists, accountants, lawyers, uh, contracting officers, et cetera. So all that to say, basically anything that you all are doing, we likely have a job for you. Um, and we likely can find place a place for you within our organization. Um, while we're headquartered here, where I'm at, right, Patterson Air Force Base, just out of, outside of Dayton, Ohio, we have sites all across the country. We're in upstate New York. We're in Arlington, Virginia. We're in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. We're in Austin, Texas. We're in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And then we also have a site just north of Los Angeles um, outside of Palmdale at Edwards Air Force Base. Thank you. Now, thanks for that context. Um, I think you made a good point. I, don't, I know at least I hadn't really even thought about it. And we've been having this conversation for a few years, but uh, you really just kind of connected dots on how you can be a civilian um, still doing military work, if you will, um, or partnering with you know, the military to advance you know, common causes. So thanks for that context. That's that's good to know. Now, within the Air Force Research Laboratory, you know, you're our, the diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility officers. So uh, talk to us a little bit about how that experience has been. And then specifically, I want to ask, you know, what has been the Air Force's commitment um, around diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially as we look at kind of the onset of, of civil justice and uh, social rights over the last, you know, three to four years. Yeah. How would you describe that commitment and actions you all have done in that, in that space? Absolutely. I'll, I'll start by saying we've truly come a long way and made a, a good amount of progress, but of course, there is always much more to be done. Um, uh, the big Air Force uh, has been very active in terms of just trying to mitigate barriers to access and opportunity. You know, over the last several years, that they have given much bigger voices to many of our underserved groups. Um, and they've done this through uh, formation of a number of barrier analysis working groups. Um, when we come down specifically in AFRL, um, we're in the process of rolling out our first uh, long-term DEIA action plan. And it's looking at the next five years, what are the um, executable things we need to be focusing on to ensure we're um, generating a workforce where, where people can show up, reach their fullest potential and, and just be themselves. People can see themselves fitting in this organization. So it's looking at things like how can we recruit better and be more representative of the nation that we serve? How can we ensure that there's equity in, in terms of our business processes and partnership opportunities? How can we ensure? And then finally, how can we ensure that the program is sustainable and it outlasts any of our current leadership. So we have been extremely active. We're, we're approaching the finish line for this, um, this action plan. I'm super excited. It's been about a year in the making, um, but we're, I mean, the finish line is near um, and it should be out and uh, uh, to the public, I'm hoping by the end of next month. Oh yeah, yeah, you're active right now. <laughs> you're actively working for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> well, well, good enough of the you know, DEIA work that's going on. You know, one of the initiatives that BDPA has been engaged with um, in collaboration with the Air Force Research Laboratory over the last few years has been the, the HBCU and Minority Serving Institution Outreach Initiative. Uh, so yeah. tell us a little bit about more about what this initiative is and what are the outcomes you're trying to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, Shout out to my colleague, uh, Anissa Lumpkin. So this was actually inspired by her. This, she, she came up with this initiative um, during her tenure with AFRL at, in the Small Business Innovative Research and Small 
Business Tech Transfer Office. So that's SBIR and STTR. And this program, the SBR STTR program, is a highly competitive program that encourages our domestic small businesses to engage in federal research um, and research and development with the potential for commercialization. But a big emphasis on the SBIR and STTR programs is the partnerships with academia in developing the technologies and attempting to commercialize. One of the uh, gaps that was noticed back in 2019 um, when Anissa was a part of the small business team was that there was a lack of representation of our HBCU and MSI community and hence the um, inception of this outreach initiative. Um, and, and this was, um, this was supported by big Air Force, of course, AFRL leadership, um, and there were a number of goals. Well, first, they, they, they put out a strategy, a five-year strategy, and there were a number of goals and objectives embedded therein. In terms of the goals, it was to increase your HBCU MSI representation or participation in the Air Force Small Business Program, um, increase research opportunities specifically for HBCU MSIs um, in Air Force competency areas, um, and then working with HBCUs MSIs to increase their success in competing for even bigger research funding opportunities um, and increase the number of spinouts that evolve from these H, uh, SBIR, STTR um, opp funding opportunities with the HBCU and MSI community. And in terms of uh, objectives, some of the broader objectives are increase awareness of this Air Force STTR program, um, educate our target audience around the program, the policies, the procedures, um, reduce barriers to entry, and finally increase the HBCU and MSI participation. No, th thank you for that context. Um, you know, there's a, a ton of talent and untapped talent um, at HBCUs and, and the MSIs around the nation. So um, I'm excited to continue to see uh, Air Force Research Laboratory continuing this work um, and putting a, an intentional focus around our, our HBCUs and minority serving institutions. Uh, so, so one of the, the events that BDPA has collaborated with you all on in the past has been the HBCU Collider. Uh, which is, you know, specifically focused on HBCU students and, you know, tagging them into these opportunities uh, with the Air Force. Uh, so uh, tell us about some of the previous Collider experiences, you know, that you all have had and then what can we look forward to in uh, what's upcoming this year? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, we're ex extremely excited for our event this year because it'll be our first in-person event. Um, due to, to the constraints of the pandemic, uh, the first three colliders were virtual, um, but even still in that virtual environment, we were able to bring together a host of um, HBCU MSI students, researchers, faculty, uh, administrators, academic professionals, as well as um, our, min our military, civilians, industry and DO, other DOD personnel. Um, this year's Collider is going to be a joint endeavor with the Air Force Institute of Technology's HBCU Digital Literacy Summit. So um, on behalf of AFRL, I must say we're extremely proud to bring in Florida Agriculture and Mechanical University, FAMU, as a partner and the host for our first in-person collider in collaboration with the Digital Literacy Summit. Well, that, that's exciting. Uh, that's exciting. Uh, going down to FAM, a lot of FAMU alum mm -hmm. are active and very close to BDPA. So uh, I'm, I'm sure there's some people perking up where they will be perking up when they hear this. So <laughs> uh, great news there. Now, so if, if memory serves me correctly, this is, I think, the fourth year uh, that we've been doing the collider. Um, and like I say, I think the first three were virtual, and if not all three, at least two of them were in conjunction with the BDPA conference. And I remember the first one that we had, I think I was either the producer for it or I was producing the session that was talking about it. So uh, this is something that's definitely uh, been been close to us for uh, BDPA. Uh, so after four years, uh, you know, just working in business a while, I know that you know, things only last that long if there's producing some results. Uh, so you know, what can you tell us about some of the success stories that have come out of the previous um, HBCU colliders or the HBCU and MSI outreach initiative in general? Yeah, so so first of all, we're still going. So we're excited for that. Um, and and uh, as a result of this outreach initiative, 
we have been able to meet many of our goals in terms of increasing participation, increasing rep representation. So first and foremost, you know, we would like to extend gratitude for the engagement, the support, the participation, and the participation that we've had in this outreach initiative over the years. Um, you know, a great leader have shared a proverb from Burkino Faso. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And so since 2019, we have been able to pull together a number of small businesses, as well as a number of HBCUs and MSIs that have been able to benefit from funding from these programs and develop a number of potential commercial, uh, com uh, commercialized products. So um, in 2022 alone, um, there were a number of phase one awards totaling a little over a million dollars. And some of those schools involved in that were Clark Atlanta University, Howard University, Howard actually had two awards, uh, Oakwood University, as well as Stillman College. Um, in addition, stepping outside of just the SBIR, STTR program, one of the things that we are extremely proud of is the recent announcement earlier this year of the first ever HBCU Department of the Air Force University Affiliated Research Center um, that was established as a consortium with Howard University as the head of that consortium. That was a $90 million five-year effort that we are hoping turns into a very long-term sustainable effort. And while the uh, outreach initiative wasn't directly responsible for that, it definitely played a role in, in getting the outreach and, and ensuring that, you know, the access to opportunities was there. Um, additionally, over the last year, there, there's been a number of events held. Um, uh, part of the outreach initiative, we host monthly Ask Me Anythings. Um, and we, we, we've we held a number over this year. The last Ask Me Anything was facilitated by Ms. Sarah Gass, the Deputy Executive Director for the Carnegie Classifications American Council on Education. And she discussed the Carnegie Classifications and the changes that may soon come. Last month, uh, I'm sorry, not last month, in April, um, we had the Digital Literacy Summit founder, uh, Dr. Reggie Turner, who will be with us uh, this September as we host the joint effort. A um, uh, month prior to that, we did uh, APEX. It was an Air Force webinar talking about funding and intro to research funding opportunities. So we're, we're continuing uh, with these outreach efforts and continuing to try to bridge the gap and ensure that we get more participation, more representation when it comes to uh, getting funding dollars from the government, from the Air Force, and just the larger Department of Defense. Um, and just FYI, we are looking for soliciting topics for the next next fiscal year. Our Ask Me Anything webinars have come to a close for the year, and we are seeking topics uh, for next year. Thank you for that, man. Great work uh, has been going on through this initiative, and you know, exciting to see what's to come as this continues to grow and expand. So kudos to you all on continuing to move these efforts forward. Uh, how can everyone participate in the, uh, participate in and support uh, the HBCU and MSI Outreach Initiative as well as the upcoming Collider? Yeah, so in terms of the upcoming Collider, the registration, website and re registration will be going live next week. I have a save the date that I can send out or share with the group um, that is present today. Um, we will be utilizing a hybrid platform. Um, and uh, so you have the opportunity to tune in virtually or attend in person down at FAMU. Um, so we, we are soliciting audience attendance. Uh, the agenda is still forthcoming. We are in the process of finalizing the keynote speaker. Um, there's gonna be a couple of panel discussions. The first one being small business su successes, some of which I talked about today, specifically with the HBCU and MSI partnerships. And then the number uh, two panel discussion will be on the HBCU MSI research hubs, um, center success and center success dialogues. So um, we're really looking forward to the engagement. Um, as I mentioned, I have a save the date. Um, additionally, you can register for the Ask Me Anything to um, just get up-to-date information regarding what's taking place with the outreach initiative, as well as um, there is a newsletter that is produced um, on a routine basis for the outreach initiative that you can stay in tune uh, and up-to-date with what's going on. 
Uh, thank you for that information. Yeah, definitely share that with us so we can make sure to push that out. Um, so just, just two things I just want to ask before we open it up to Q&A to the rest of the audience. Uh, so the, the first one, just in general, uh, do you recommend any resources uh, for those on the call who want to learn more about the outreach initiative, the HBC Collider, or just being more effective as business people and leaders in general? Yeah, so um, in general, if you want to learn more or just uh, be get involved with what we're doing with the Collider or the Outreach Initiative, I would encourage you to um, share your email address with me. We can get you added to our um, uh, our listserv to ensure that as we're sending out um, our newsletters, um, quarterly newsletters, you are receiving those newsletters. Additionally, you can follow our channel on Eventbrite for the Ask Me Anythings, and that will keep you up to date with um, uh, the ongoing activities there. And I can drop those links in the chat, or I can share them with Devin, um, and, and you can send out a, a, a larger email um, so that people can save, save this information for their future reference. Um, additionally, in terms of AFRL ongoing activities, um, we, we have uh, our website, afresearchlab.com. Um, it mentions on there opportunities to partner, opportunities to find employment, um, and just opportunities to engage. We have what's called the um, Science and Technology Front Door, which, you know, if you have opportunities that you would like to chat with someone, specifically in AFRL, um, or in the science and technology space, um, we ask you to go through our front door. Or, you know, I, I'm always a resource and always willing to uh, engage and, and make any connections that I possibly can. Um, I will drop my LinkedIn. Actually, I don't know if I have my LinkedIn information. Let me see if I can find it real quick and I'll drop it in the chat um, for you all to connect with me. Okay, and I was going to work on pulling that up too, but you can get to it. That's fine because I don't know how much I trust me internet right now. <laughs> <laughs> I just dropped it in the chat. Good, good, good. Well, yeah, my last question is going to be how can everyone stay engaged with you after you know this conversation? I'm yeah, connected. and I, so all in, in addition, I just dropped my LinkedIn in there. My email, I'll drop that in as well. It's marcus.smith.27 at us.af.mil. So that is there. You can connect with me either way. I'm very responsive on LinkedIn and to email and happy to further engage on this conversation. Or, I mean, happy to explore some other opportunities but to potentially, potentially collaborate and partner with AFRL. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, at this time, I wanna open the floor up for any questions or comments from the audience. So um, if you're in the audience and there's something you would like to ask or, or speak to, uh, feel free to come off mute and ask your question. Or if you're unable to speak right now, you can put it in the chat and I will ask it for you. So the floor is open. Uh oh, don't be too shy. <laughs> I have a question. Sure. Yeah. So, what is uh, the process? Because I understand, and sorry, I got on late. I'm kind of been in route in transport. Uh, so, uh, what would be the best avenue, um, you know, f as a student research, doing research, my uh, passions and what I'm working on is like technology and mental health. Uh, and from talking to one of my advisors at the school, um, it was stated that it may be a good idea to see um, what military sectors are doing. What is a good way or a good approach, approach to, to take or plan to put together to start kind of knocking that wall down? So there are a couple of avenues that I can think of offhand. So first, can you you tell me how far along you are in your program and uh, just when you're planning to finish? Okay, well, I'm done with undergrad. I'm in the MBA program now at Georgia State. Yep. And um, so I've got a couple more years of school. Um, and basically what um, and how I found out about BDPA was there was a traditional student that told me about the program. And so I, you know, I learned a lot and 
uh, what I had started seeing were, you know, things ha happening in the mental health sector. And I kept saying, hey, technology. So right now I'm in the process of trying to put together a prototype. Um, hopefully, God willing, I can have it out by uh, spring of next year. Uh, so that's where I'm. I've done research on mental health, mental health stats. Um, you know, we've, there are increases in suicide rates um, in different age ranges. Uh, so that's kind of where I am right now. So any, any advice on a direction to head in, I would be truly grateful. Yeah, absolutely. So, so one, um, this falls under, we have what's called the human performance wing here at AFRL, and, and they do a number of studies regarding just human centered interactions. So mental health definitely falls under there. So I, I would be happy to, you know, make a connection there to our human performance wing, if you could send me your resume. Additionally, um, there's a number of funding opportunities that you can apply for to further advance your education um, in partnership with us being the Department of Defense or um, specifically an AFRL. So, so the, the um, uh, fellowship or scholarship I was able to take advantage of was the DOD SMART Fellowship. Um, and they are, uh, uh, each year they fund, I want to say four to 500 students to uh, pursue undergrad, masters, and PhDs in specific areas that are of relevance to the Department of Defense. Um, and mental health is is really climbing up to the top of the list. So I would encourage you to um, look into the DOD Smart Fellowship opportunity. The application window is actually, I believe, it opens back up on August first, and this would be for a spring, I'm sorry, uh, fall 2024 um, start date for the fellowship. So just um, two things to consider. I'd be happy to, to pass your resume along, as well as, you know, if you're interested in continuing to pursue uh, additional education, the SMART fellowship would be uh, monumental. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. And I put my email in the chat. It's the okay. TPL SMART. Okay, I great. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is open. Excuse me, I have, I have a question. So where are you all with cloud computing of like AWS and all that technology? So, so I don't know all of the specifics, um, but we are heavily, I do know we are heavily involved in the uh, cloud computing space. We have our information director at RI up in uh, upstate New York that does a lot of the um, cyber um, AI and, and things of that nature. And we also have um, a, a computing space here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base that's heavily involved in the space. So I don't know the state of the art and just where we are exactly at this moment, but we're, we're ve very involved in the space. One more question. I graduated from an HBCU, um, Mississippi Valley State, a mm -hmm. while back. So when I was pursuing uh, my degree in accounting and business administration, there was no outlet for us to go get in technology. So I heard you mention a bunch of colleges, but not no state uh, institution like Mississippi Valley State, a small mm -hmm. institution like that. Mm -hmm. Do you all have a program for those type of colleges? So, so when we're talking about our engagement with HBCUs and minority serving other minority serving institutions, um, it, it's not limited limited to just the 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 bigger schools. So as long as there is overlap in terms of research interests or or just professional interests um, with what we're trying to do and what the academic institute is doing, we we are trying to find opportunities to partner. You know, traditionally, we have not done the best in terms of our outreach and engagement and ensuring that we cast our umbrella wide and far, but we are definitely taking a different approach um, and trying to ensure that that we are developing as many partnerships um, with 
uh, the community and universities as we possibly can, um, because you know we're uh, at the end of the day there's a huge competition for talent, and we want the best and the brightest. And there is no one single school or entity that the best and the brightest come from. So we we really have to um, cast our net far and wide. Thanks. No problem. Other questions or comments from the group? Yeah, I have one. I was busy typing away in your LinkedIn and inquiring, and I said, I might as well just jump on here this well. So excellent presentation. Enjoyed last year, enjoyed this year in chatting with the people from your organization. And in, in as much, do you find that, um, how do you want to put it, uh, the common person engaging with your organization and engaging with the organization is a rough road to toe in terms of the lines and how to do that engagement or is it pretty much send a proposal to you and then start a conversation so so i believe historically the road has been a little rougher right uh -huh. i believe that the access to opportunity has it it hasn't necessarily been a level playing field right and if you know if you know someone it's it's going to be a much easier or or shorter shorter road travel to to develop those partnerships but we are really trying to break down those barriers and ensure that we're putting everybody on a on a equitable playing field in terms of just being able to give people what they need and not give everybody just a, a the an equal not not give everybody the same thing so we're, we really are trying to ensure that there's equitable opportunities across the board and not taking a one size fits all in terms of how we do business and how we develop partnerships and we understand that some people know exactly who afrl is how to get in how to get it their foot in the door and others may not have a clue and we have to ensure that as a government entity we're reaching far and wide and, and and ensuring they have the same access is it best for me to have started with you and through our communication you can help me shepherd a vision into the organization yeah uh i i i would be happy to do so um and if i'm not the right person you know, I could point you in the right direction, but I, I think I would be a good starting place. Absolutely. Excellent. Okay. Well, I dropped the info in LinkedIn as well as in the chat. I'll okay. The next conversation. Absolutely. You know what? Let me piggyback on that. Sure. In as, in as much as you've been kind enough to come to us, BDPA has a number of upskilling academies. And I'm wondering, how can we leverage what we do for our membership from the classroom up to and through the boardroom and all points in between? How do we best engage that with you that way when you're looking for people who've graduated from our cloud academy and you can assess, oh, I see you've got certifications here. BDPA has prepared you really well. Here's where we still need this or you're already ready to do that. Yeah, so so that that is very progressive thinking, right? And just being having foresight, and those are the types of conversations that we we need to have. We understand that the workforce, as we see it now, is evolving and is is changing, and certificate programs are going a lot much uh, can go a long way nowadays, and not necessarily people don't necessarily need to have the advanced certification in terms of a master's degree or sometimes even a bachelor's. So we are trying to get out and, and understand what type of certificate programs are out there, how we can um, be infused with these programs and ensure that the skill sets that we're looking for are being um, uh, infused into some of these certificate programs. So by the time these students are finishing, they're ready to hit the ground running with us. I love that. So in as much, I likely could have a conversation. I'll put that on the agenda for when we talk deeper. And that would be, how can I map out a curriculum, a core curriculum, that way it meets the needs of what you have. And then we can build a unique piece and actually upskill people to hit the ground running yeah. with you. Yeah, those are the type of programs we need. Uh, that That's okay. absolutely what we need. Just, I mean, uh, 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 
a good level of alignment to ensure that we are creating many of pathways into our workforce. Great. I look forward to the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Anything else from anyone? Okay, well, if not, uh, Smith, I'll let you give us some last words on your end, and then I'll close this out. All right, all right. Um, I just want to say, uh, on behalf of Air Force Research Laboratory, thank you for um, hosting uh, us and allowing us the opportunity to engage with you all here at BDPA and present to you some of our upcoming opportunities. Look forward to um, further engagement with you all and having you participate in some of our up upcoming opportunities. And again, if I can be of assistance to any of you all, feel free to shoot me an email, feel free to drop me a message on LinkedIn, and I'm happy to further engage. Thank you again. Thank you for that. Um, and I was just responding to a message I got here by Keith, Keith Scott, uh, Zernio, and, I, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, I apologize and correct me. Uh, but, but Keith Scott, uh, Zernio is asking for your LinkedIn. I'm in the chat. So if you don't mind sharing that. Okay, we will do. Oh, I do have a quick question um, for Mark right. before we depart. Um, I'm on a board of a company called Level 42 AI. Um, and we're in the process, we're doing some work with Air Force Research Lab, by the way. We're a digital data analytics intelligence um, startup, Silicon Valley startup, um, that's launching um, devices that can detect um, up to 64 diseases that the current infrastructure in the medical field cannot uh, discern. Um, we'll be FDA approved in a couple of months. Um, doing work with the Air Force Research Lab, I was wondering, are there institutions that you guys could recommend um, HBCUs, minority institutes that are specializing in different things that could partner with startup technology companies so we can um, partner with them on their expertise in AI, data science, um, things of that nature. Would you so, be a good person to point to to kind of capture a good partner as we're pursuing different efforts? So pointing you in the direction of a partner likely wouldn't be me, but I would say a good starting place so uh, I mentioned AFRL just developed uh, the first uh, HBCU University Affiliated Research Center. The focus of that research center is tactical autonomy. So thinking of artificial intelligence uh, and uh, machine learning, things of that nature. So that may be a good starting place. That is, um, there's nine universities involved in that with Howard University being the lead. So um, that that could potentially be a really good starting place for you. Awesome, thanks. And, and I'll drop the email in the chat for um, you to just send a, a teaser um, to the program manager um, for the UR, if that helps. Yes, thanks. Because it's still an open forum, I took the opportunity to respond to Keith as well. I'm a previous advisor with TMCX Innovation Institute that handles the entire Texas Medical Center. And uh, in that space, we have a lot of VCs as well as J-Labs Houston. So we can get in on the ground floor with that as well. Well, that's good to know because we just got accepted into J-Labs DC. <laughs> there it is. J-Labs San Francisco. So um, we're... It will be FDA approved in a couple of months and we're doing our soft launch October the 1st. Uh, DOD will be our first customer. Uh, we're being sponsored by Uniform Services University. Okay. Um, and by the way, this, the work we're doing with Air Force Research Lab is our sensors are um, being developed with uh, Martin Baker to be put into um, the jump seats of fighter pilots because we can oh, detect all, all the, the health performance benefits of um, pilots and, and we're working on the commercial side as well. Um, and then they also went our centuries in the helmets of pilots because we can um, give 90% visibility um, to um, performance that current technology doesn't use in bright bulb acoustics, which is a new science that we just published, okay. um, submitted our subscription and got approved for. You'll be hearing a lot about that as we start. Congratulations. Out campaign. 
Yeah, Thank that's you. awesome. I'll be I'll be pinging you. Absolutely. Thank you, Keith. All right. Can you hear me okay? Am I choppy? All right. Hope it's smooth, as, smooth as a hot knife <laughs> through butter, man. <laughs> All right. Thank you again uh, to, to Marcus for sharing with us today. I uh, appreciate your insights around all that's going on with the research laboratory and HBC outreach initiative. Uh, I've just shared in the chat the link for BDPA Con 23. That's conference.bdpa.org. Uh, make sure you uh, do it now. Do it now. Get in there uh, before it all sells out. So <laughs> go ahead and register uh, for the conference link if this after the uh, session today, as well as our previous recordings from our Tech and Career Talks, you can go to bdpa.org backslash tech and career. You can also go to YouTube to our national BDPA channel. Unstable notification again. All right, hope this worked. Uh, but you can go to YouTube. So, um, national BDPA is our YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, comment, share, all that influence the talk. Uh, but all the recordings are out there. And we will be glad to see you in our next talk uh, coming up. I think it's July 14th, something like that. Uh, second Friday in July, whenever that is, we'll be back again with another great one for you. So thank you all for joining. Uh, until next time, stay safe, stay blessed, and we will see you soon. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great weekend.